I know early service was packed this morning, even people on the ramp, and to see uh, so many people just come into God's house today, it's just such a blessing. So thank you for being here. If you're visiting with us today, we do want to say welcome. Thank you for being here. And uh, just so that you know, we have one thing on the agenda today, and the purpose of this church is what, church? To glorify God, so that His name is lifted up today. So we invite you uh, to fill out a visitor's card. You'll find one in your bulletin. It's attached to your bulletin. Just please fill it out, send it in, so that we can correspond with you. And uh, if you want any information on the church, we can give it to you. But thank you so much for being here. If you have your bulletins today, I do have a couple of announcements that I want to give you. Uh, first of all, don't forget there's a, a registration table as you come in the church. That is an Awana registration table. Awana program will be starting back up in September. We want you to get your child registered, so please stop and, and register your child. Also, uh, if you look in your bulletins, you will be able to see that there's a lot of things that are going on. First of all, there's a meeting today uh, for the children's ministry, and we want you to be at that meeting. If you're a volunteer in any way, whether it's children's church, whether it's nursery, no matter what it is, walkers and talkers, whatever you're doing to help volunteer to watch children, please be at the meeting today because we're going to go over things for the upcoming year, uh, changes, and Miss Angie's got some things that she wants to go over, so please be there at 5 o'clock today. This is today at 5 o'clock, Children's Ministry Meeting. And then Wednesday night, we're going to have a pretty neat service. Um, we're going to combine uh, all those things that happened in VBS this year and Children's Camp, and the children are going to be singing songs. People are going to be giving testimony. Uh, so if you participated in VBS this year, how many people in here participated in VBS? Kids, adults, so a lot of you. This will be your chance to be able to bear witness on Wednesday night. We would love to have some of the leaders, some of the uh, people that volunteered to be able to speak about it, how the Lord blessed you. And then if you think about it, between both things, we had 10 children uh, get saved, accept the Lord as their Savior. So what a great summer that was. And we want to be able to give praise about it uh, Wednesday night. I know you'll be blessed, so please be at that service. It's at 630. Then you'll be able to see that there's a lot of things happening uh, between uh, property team meeting, children's end of summer party. There's dates in there for that. Uh, a youth parent meeting coming up. A senior adults have a meeting coming up. And then notice on the 23rd of August, two Sundays from now in the evening, we'll have a special musical guest that's going to be here that night. And you don't want to miss that. That's August 23rd, 6 p.m., uh, Derwin Henson is going to be here, and he is uh, just a talented musician that, that's able to play and sing, and I know you'll be blessed to come and, and be able to hear him. Miss Vicki has uh, contacted him. He's going to be here that evening. He goes around and travels and, and praises the Lord, and that's his ministry, so please don't miss that. That's two Sunday evenings from now. And then don't forget also uh, there's opportunities in there for Samaritan shirt, Samaritan's Purse shoebox. There's also uh, Save the Date that you're supposed to save for the Pregnancy Support Center. They're going to have a walk uh, like they do every year. The date in there is in there for that. And then as we go to different prayer requests, uh, don't forget that um, our college kids are going to be going back to school. And that's going to be in the upcoming week, some this week, some next week. But be lifting them up in prayer as they go through transition, as they go and leave home, that God's protection would be on them. So please lift those up. Lift our deacon elections up. We'll be uh, electing those deacons on uh, August the 30th, and uh, we have um, deacons that have accepted the nomination. Those names will be in your bulletins next week. Uh, they will be giving a testimony on the 26th of August, so um, that's all coming up, but the church needs to be in prayer about it to know that we put in place who God wants. As far as prayer requests go, uh, with different needs, you have a prayer list on the back of your bulletin, and you know the ones that we uh, always mention, continue to be praying for those that are uh, struggling with cancer, leukemia, going through treatments, and that's Bob Lohman, Jeff Earnhardt, Nancy Lynn, uh, Wendy Maynard, all of those going through treatments now. Please be praying for them. Uh, be praying for Kendall Ferguson. Uh, be praying for Bonnie Posick as she's recovering, and also for Danny Carlisle. He had surgery this week at CMC, so be lifting him up. Uh, Miss Binge is at Rowan. She'll be coming home, so be praying for her, uh, hopefully this week. And then uh, a new person on the, the prayer list that I want to mention to you, and I'd like you just to be earnestly praying. And uh, this is a newborn that was born this week. His name's Sawyer Black. And uh, Sawyer was born to Megan and Adam Black, and some of you may know them. But, um, but Sawyer's grandparents, uh, which is Molly and Todd Snyder, they've been coming here for a while. Sawyer was born Monday, but he had a, uh, quite a bit of fluid on his brain, so he was taken to CMC. They've been treating him. Uh, they've done several procedures. They're trying to find out what's going on, but of course... Uh, it is a time where uh, we need to be lifting them up in prayer for God's healing, God's strength to the parents, the grandparents, the whole family. So 
uh, please be praying for them uh, and be lifting them up at this time. Also, uh, be praying for Travis Walker's dad, Tommy Walker. He's in uh, row in. So we have a lot of needs and uh, we need to be praying for and lifting people up that are going through uh, troubles and trials right now. Uh, also be praying for Josh. Uh, we mention Josh every week, but be praying for Josh Owens. Uh, he's still waiting to see uh, what the Lord's going to do. He's looking for a, a, a caregiver to be able to take the job uh, that he has available of, of caring for him and also a place to be able to live. And uh, hopefully that will meet the need of whoever uh, takes the job and Josh's need. We know that the Lord's hands in it. So we're patiently waiting on God and we're praying believing prayers, aren't we, Josh? So uh, y'all keep praying. Uh, also, uh, if you have a prayer request that you want to mention by raising your hand today, uh, the Lord sees those hands. We'll pray together. Father God, we love you. We praise you. And we thank you so much for just allowing us to be here today, giving us the freedom to come and worship, giving us a place to worship. And Lord, just the ability to come in here today and and be able to, to come into a, a place that, that, Lord, is legal for us to come into, Lord, that we have the ability to sit and listen, to be able to understand. We just thank you for all those things that normally we take for granted. We just pray, God, today for each prayer request that's been mentioned, either, Lord, by the hands that were raised or mentioned out loud. You know the need. You know, Lord, those that need physical healing. You know, Lord, those that are going through emotionally hard times. We just pray for your healing in all these matters. And we lift these prayer requests up to you. And we pray this according to your will. We accept whatever your perfect will is. And then we give this service to you today, Lord, knowing that we don't come in here, Lord, just for formality. We don't come in here for duty. We come in here, Lord, to be able to experience your presence. And we just pray that you would just take control of this service, that you would speak to us today, that you would remove every distraction on our minds so that we can see and hear and understand your message today. We pray, God, as we begin to lift our voice up in song, that you would receive our praise and your presence falls upon this place. And if there are any here that are, that are lost without you, they've never accepted Jesus as their Savior, maybe they're unsure, we just pray, God, they would come to salvation knowledge today. And for all of us here today, Lord, the ones that have accepted your gift of salvation, we just pray that through your message you would draw us closer, Lord, that you would let us see what you want us to do to please you, Lord. We just pray, God, that you would have your will and your way in the service. We just ask you, Lord, just to bless in everything that's said and done. Receive all glory. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Are you guys ready to worship this morning? We're going to start worshiping by lifting our voice in song. I'm going to ask the choir to come forward. I'm going to ask you to turn to page 288. This should be the prayer of every person in here. What we need is a closer walk with God. to God as they continue to come we're going to begin the worship service by lifting up our voices and some of you may say well I can't sing well your Savior knows your voice and guess what he wants to hear it let's sing unto God this morning lift up your voices Yeah. 
page 157. Stand up for Jesus. 157. Stand up for Jesus.
Heavenly Father, we love you. And we thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. We thank you that you will help us to stand for you, that you'll su support us as we stand, that you'll draw us close to you, that you'll forgive us when we fail you, Lord, and you'll restore us. Lord, we thank you that you provide a way that we can come to you, Lord. We come here to worship this morning, and we know that you're here in our presence. Father, we thank you that at times we fail to do what you'd have us to do, but you're always faithful. Lord, we just love you so much, but we know that we love you that you first loved us yeah. and no, no matter how we stand for you we are soldiers of the cross we know Lord that we have our own weaknesses we have our own concerns our cares even our worries at times Lord but we know that if we place our trust and our faith in you that you'll never let us down Lord that you have a have a plan for each one of us for each of our fr families, our friends, that in every difficulty that you're at work to draw us close to you, to hold us in your hand, Lord. We thank you that you have a plan for each one who's on our prayer list, Lord, each one we've lifted up this morning for all the unspoken prayers that we have for each concern each difficulty, each problem in our life that in your faith, your faithfulness, that you restore us, that you draw us close to you. Father, we ask you now that if there's anyone in this group, anyone here this morning that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, that you'll draw them to you. Father, we ask you to let us be the reflection of your shining light in this darkened world Lord we see so many saddened faces so many people that are dealing with troubles and tribulations Lord let us be the encourager and the bearer of your gospel message and that message is salvation through your son Jesus Christ it's in his holy and precious name we pray amen <laughs> We will continue to sing on page 125, My Hope is Built. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust a sweetest frame.
Heavenly Father, we come to you today asking your blessings upon the offering that's going to be given. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to give back because we've been blessed so much. Lord, even in need, even when we feel we're in need, Lord, you fulfill all our needs if we just ask you. Heavenly Father, we pray that through this service people will be saved. That, Lord, as Mike speaks, we hear your words and they touch our heart, Heavenly Father. Lord, we thank you for being our solid rock. For realizing that no matter what, no matter how hard the wind blows, no matter how big the trouble, you are always our rock. Lord, as the song said, you will lead your troops. Lord, may we let you lead your troops. We lift you above all today. We praise you today. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for saving us. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask all the children, if they would, to come forward. Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good. You guys look bright-eyed this morning. Good to see you. Listen, this morning, I want to talk to you about... Uh, Ships. Has anybody ever been on a ship? No. Have you? Have you ever been on a boat? Anybody? Listen, we're going to take a boat this morning. Anybody want to take a boat? We're going to pretend we're on a boat. We're going to pretend we're on a ship, but I'm probably going to have to have somebody help me this morning, um, an adult. So I'm going to get Mr. Jim. Is Mr. Jim in here? Mr. Jim, I want you to sail the ship of Jim this morning, okay? I want you to sail, not fly the ship of Jim. I want you to sail the ship of Jim, okay? You don't want to be on a ship that's going like that, I'm telling you. Here, so I'm going to give Mr. Jim. He's going to help me this morning, so I'll give him these, all right? So listen, how many people know that, that when you get on the ship, then you're going to get what's on the ship? So Mr. Jim's got a ship. You can see what he's got. Anybody that wants to sail on Mr. Jim's ship, then you can go with Mr. Jim. Go ahead and go. I'll get on Mr. Jim's ship. All right. So you can be on Mr. Jim's ship, all right? So that's Mr. Jim's ship. You want to go on him? He's going to be going that way. I'm going to sail a different ship. I'm going to have I'm going to have Mike's ship tonight too, so or t this morning too. So I've got a ship here. It's just he's got something a little bit different than mine. But I can guarantee you that you'll like being on my ship too. So anybody that wants to go on Mr. Jim's ship, get behind me. Get behind him. Anybody that wants to go on my ship, get behind me. Come on, let's go down. Here we go. Everybody on my ship, come on. If you're going on Jim's ship, ship, Jim. Not train, all right? All right. Can you hold up a second there? Hold up a second. All right. All right. You can clearly see who's on your ship, right? How many people are on my ship? Raise your hand. How many people are on Mr. Jim's ship? All right. 
People on my ship come with me. People on his ship go with him. All right, let's go. Here you go. Oh, Hold on. Here you go. All right, stay with me. Stay with me. Don't leave. Secret hideout. Yeah, stay with me. Don't leave. There you go. How many people are happy about this? How many people think you took the right ship? All right, stay with me. Don't go anywhere. Come behind me. Here, everybody, come on. Everybody, come on. Here you go. Here's two. Here you go. Here's two. Here's two. Here's two. All right, here you go. Don't go anywhere. All right, has everybody got them? Don't go anywhere. Everybody that's on my ship, keep coming with me. Let's go. Hey, where's your ship? All right, here's my ship. Hold on. Everybody that's on my ship, stand right here with me. Let's go. Behind the ship. Behind the ship. All right, can you see what my ship has here? Yeah. What do they have? Okay, well, that's what everybody got on my ship. Where, where are y'all going to get on his ship? All right, all right, go ahead. Whatever you get on Jim's ship, you get on Jim's ship. Jim, let's go. What are y'all getting? What are y'all getting? Nothing. Nothing. Jim wanted you to go on his ship, but all he had was a box. Why did y'all go on Jim's ship? Because you thought he had what? Yeah, you thought he did. But listen, you just chose the wrong ship. So here's what I want to do. Everybody that came on my ship, why did you go on my ship? I didn't have any fruity snacks. Why did you come on mine? Why did you think you wanted to? No, I wasn't God. No. What do you always get at the end if you stick with me? You always do it. So you knew from times before, even if I'm not holding a box, what did you know I was going to take you to? And you knew it. That's why you didn't follow them, right? So here, I want you, if you got two packs of fruity snacks, I want you to share one with them and then come back over here with me. Y'all go share one with those. Uh, give every one of those one. Here, come back with me. Here you go. Here. All right, sit down with me here. Sit down with me. Don't go anywhere. Listen, which was the right ship to be on? My ship. You know why? Well, partly because I came up with this little skit, so I wasn't going to make my ship be the, be the bad ship. But Jim's ship didn't give anything, you know. But Jim sounded like he was going to give you something, didn't he? he? Kept telling you to come on and come. Has everybody got fruity snacks here? Yeah. Okay. Um, Jim kept telling you to come on and come on. But listen. The reason I'm telling you that is because as you get older, and you can ask some of these people out here, you'll have chances to get on different ships. And I'm not talking about really boats. I mean go different directions in life. And you'll go different ways because you think they're going to give you something. But God is always faithful. If you get on God's ship and you follow God's ship, not me. I'm just the pastor. I was just pretending to be the right ship. But if you get on God's ship, then you know that He's always going to take you to where He says He's going to take you. So you get on God's ship by, God ship by accepting Jesus into your heart. You know it? So if you accept Jesus into your heart, where do you know that God's ship is going to take you? Where is it going to take you? Somebody tell me. I know. It's going to take you to heaven. Exactly right, Layla. It's going to take you to heaven. It's always going to take you to heaven. And no matter what, He's got a reward for you. But guess what? He gives you a reward even while you're on this earth. He gives you the peace and knowing that if you follow Him, you're always going to be taken care of. So... Don't get fooled by all these different opportunities. You know what? You're going to have people that come up to you that promise you, hey, if you do this thing that's bad, then it'll be okay. Or if you cheat or if you lie or if you tell somebody something that you're not supposed to or you talk about somebody that it's all right, that's the wrong ship to be on. You want to be on God's ship. God's ship is going to get you to where you want to be. And you're always going to receive blessings. Not fruity snacks, but blessings, okay? So pray with me. Lord, I love you, I praise you, and I thank you for these children. I pray, God, that you would continue to influence their hearts and minds. Lord, that you would raise up a church that would minister to others. In Jesus' name, amen.
All right, if you got your fruity snacks, you can go. But remember, don't eat them in church. Wait till after you get home to eat them. At, eat them after church. If you haven't started kindergarten yet, you can go to children's church. That children's sermon was as much for you and me as it was for them. Understand, in their life right now, all they see is fruity snacks. All they see is candy. They don't have any financial goals. They don't have anything that they're aspiring to do. They don't have a career path. They don't have anything that would cause them disappointment if they didn't achieve it. All they know is immediate gratification. I want this. But understand the bigger picture. They followed what they thought was going to give them immediate gratification, which was Jim's ship. But the ones that followed me did it not because I was holding a box of what they wanted. It was because they had gotten it before and they always got it. So in other words, they knew in essence to follow me, I was going to be faithful in rewarding them and following me. So the picture is the same thing that we get with God. And today, I want to be able to use a story that the Bible gives us, really three stories that the Bible gives us, to tie it together so that we can understand that it is important which ship that you get onto. It is important when you go through hard times, what God wants you to do, what He wants you to experience. It is important that you realize that His ship will take you to where you're supposed to go. So if you have your Bible today, I want you to open it. First, stand up and hold it above your head. Bear witness of God's Word. That way we know. This is our authority. This is what we're going to be using today. You may be seated. If you would, please turn to the book of Matthew chapter 4. And then we're going to end up in Acts chapter 27. Matthew 4, Acts 27. When you find your place, say, I have it. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22, we see as Jesus began his ministry. When he began his ministry, he began to call people to join him. We see him as he walked along the Sea of Galilee. We see him as he interacted with four people that we became familiar with, with Simon Peter, his brother Andrew, and then James and John. So as he interacted with them, understand that he walked along and he looked to see what they were doing and then he called them. So let's read verses 18 through 22. Matthew 4. It says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and they immediately left the ship and their father, and they followed him. So we see immediately the calling of these four disciples. But I want you to look deeper than just the calling of these four disciples. I want you to notice where Jesus found them where he was taking them. And as we go through the progression of these stories, I want you to understand how important it was for them to leave where they were at, to go with him, and what that gives an individual believer, somebody like me and you. I want us to be able to see what happens in direct correlation with the ship that we get on, what happens when we face a storm, when we're riding on the right ship. And I want us to be able to see the provision that God gives us and why we might be in storm. So all of those things working in this message, understanding first that these men chose to make a decision. When we read verses 18 through 22, we see in verse 18 
that they were casting their net. And I want you to notice a couple of details in this story that we don't pick up on a lot of times. How many people have ever seen fishermen fishing with nets? Anybody in here ever been fishing? If you've been fishing, raise your hand. Have you ever fished with nets? A lot of times we fish with, with rod and reels. We fish with cane poles. Some of us fish with our hands, right? But listen, these people were fishing with nets. It was their income. It was their livelihood. And so as Jesus walks up, he sees Simon, Peter, and Andrew, and they were casting their net. Understand this. They were busy. They were busy doing what brings them income. They were busy trying to put food on the table. They were busy trying to carry on their livelihood. And he has one request. He told them, he asked them basically, it was a question. He said, follow me. Say that with me. Follow me. What was his two words? Tell me again. Follow me. So what did he have to offer? What was he holding? Well, I would assume, and this is what I'm going to do this morning, because when we look at scriptures, we're supposed to look and see where God leads us. So if Jesus walked by, this story is deeper than we take it on, on the face value. As he was walking by, he saw Peter and he saw Andrew casting their net. Now, how many people have ever been fishing? Raise your hand again if you've been fishing. Now, how many people have ever been fishing but not catching? Amen. More raised their hand that said they've been fishing and not catching. I've been fishing before, but not catching. So they should call it either catching or not catching, not fishing. But I say that to say this. They were casting their net. It never says they were catching fish. You know what they were doing? They were going through life the same way that we do. They were casting a net, casting a net. You know, that's what we do a lot of times. We spend a lot of time casting our net in life, but we don't catch a lot of fish, do we? Now notice the story goes on because we need to see how important this is. It does never say that they were pulling in fish. In other words, in Jesus' look at them, he would have been able to see. You don't keep casting and casting if you're catching. You would spend some time taking the fish out of the net the story goes on in verse 20 after he called them it says they left their nets and followed him so let's talk about their nets a minute we don't talk much about their nets understand that their net were their means of provision they cast their nets to catch fish and to make an income and a food source their nets were important but there's no promise when you cast your net that you're going to catch fish, is there? I've cast a net many, many times and not come up with fish. I've thrown my rod and reel out many, many times and not come up with fish. There's no promise. You're just hoping that you catch something. But I want you to notice because the story goes on. You see, Jesus tells them this. He says, and you know this phrase because it's a pretty popular phrase. It says, that Jesus said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, I want to do a little bit of what we call deductive reasoning here. And we have to do that with the Bible. He gives us an intellect to try to do deductive reasoning. How many people in here have ever been catching fish? And I mean catching fish. Listen, I love to fish. And when I go to this certain time, when I go to the coast and I'm fishing, my wife will tell you, the hardest thing to do is get me back to where she is when the fish are biting. Amen. You don't leave when fish are biting. Deductive reasoning. Jesus called Simon and Andrew and they left their nets. Why did they leave their nets? They weren't catching anything. Now think about that. He came to them at a moment when they were casting and casting, but not catching. Isn't that awesome, the way God knows when to come and tell us to come, follow him? And so he tells them, but he gives them something else. He says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Not fishers of fish, because you never know. You can catch fish or not, not catch fish, but here's my promise. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. In other words, I will give you something that makes an eternal difference. Not a temporary difference. You catch fish, you clean fish, you eat fish, you're hungry again. I will make you fishers of men. And notice the story goes on. In verse 21, Jesus comes upon two more, James and John. They were in their ship 
But they were doing something different. They weren't casting their net. They were doing what? They were mending their nets. So there's a difference between casting a net and mending a net. Mending a net means you were fixing your net. And Jesus called them. And we see in verse 22 that they immediately left the ship and their father and they followed him. They were not casting net. They were mending nets. Why? Why would they be mending nets? Nets get holes in them, don't they? Nets wear out. I mean, think about our nets. You say, well, I don't have nets. Sure you do. What is it that you're trying to obtain in life? What is it that you want? Is it financial security? Is it something in a relationship? Is it some kind of recognition? Is it good health? Is it just something that you aspire to do? Well, guess what? You know what you do every day? You know what I do? We throw nets at it, don't we? We throw nets. We want to obtain it. So the nets is a picture of what we put out there to try to gather into ourselves. But if your net is like my net, I spend a lot of time mending my net. Do you? My net gets holes in it. In other words, I come up with this grand and glorious plan all through life. I can look back and I can say, hey, here's what I wanted to obtain. Here's my plan. My net is my plan. So I'll throw my plan at that and then I'll realize, hey, there's a lot of holes in my plan. Can I get a witness? Did it ever happen to anybody? So I spent a lot of times revamping my plan. Okay, that didn't work, but here, so here's what we're going to do. Now I'll throw another net and then that net has a hole in it. So I'm mending my net. I don't get any fishing done for mending my net of life. Do you? So if you think about it, I don't want to get depressed here, but I spent a lot of times casting my net and mending my net, but never catching fish. And that's where Jesus found both of these guys. All four were not catching fish, and he gave them the promise, I will make you fishers of men. A guaranteed harvest. We know that these disciples walk with Jesus, and we know that they experienced things that are unspeakable. We know by listening to the Bible, following those stories, that they saw miracles happen. They felt the closeness of walking with the Son of God, and they were used to hearing Jesus spread the gospel. So what he did was he used them to spread the gospel. He made them fishers of men. But we need to see what they left to follow Jesus. You see, they left their ship. They left their nets. And that is something that most of us are not willing to do. We want that closeness with God. We want success. We want prosperity. But our clear picture is we have to be willing to leave our ship and our tattered old nets and be able to follow him. You say, well, what happens when you follow him? Well, I'm glad you asked because we're going to turn to the next story. You see, they left their ship. They left their nets. Basically, our ship is our security. It's our personal vehicle that we make the center of all of our activities around. It could be our education. It could be our job. It could be our family. Our nets. Our nets are what gather our plans, our efforts that we cast out every day to achieve our goals. So they left their own to obey his command. What was that two-word command again? Follow me. Follow me. So we see what happens when they followed him. Turn a couple of pages over to Matthew chapter 8. The next story that we see is a pretty interesting story. Verses 22 through 26. We learn that the disciples followed Jesus onto another ship. They left their ship and they got on the ship with Jesus. How many people have left your ship and got on the ship with Jesus? Amen. Amen. So we're going to talk about that in context to us getting on Jesus' ship today. And let's see the story he's trying to tell us. Verses 22 through 26, Matthew chapter 8. The Bible says, But Jesus said unto him, Follow me, let the dead bury their dead. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples, everybody say this with me, followed him. Say it again. They followed him. So they left their ship and they followed him into what? His ship. They left their ship, followed him into this ship. It's it's a pretty picture here, so watch as it develops. The Bible says, And behold, there there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are you fearful? 
O ye of little faith. Then he arose. He rebuked the winds and the sea. And there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? They would have never seen that on their own ship, would they? But they got on Jesus' ship. So let's talk a little bit about this next story. They got off of their ship. They got onto a ship that they followed him onto, which means he had authority over that ship. And this ship was a ship that they were taking to get from one point to another point. If you read this story, you'll understand that they were trying to get from one side of the Sea of Galilee to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. This was not a fishing ship. You say, why is that important? Listen, if you will. Do you know that all of us are inclined to make our ship a fishing ship? That's the first ship that you want to be on. He said, not me, I don't want to fish. Well, I'm, I'm using the analogy here so you'll understand. Everybody here, we have something inside of us that drives us. We want our ship to be a fishing ship, a ship to where we can cast our net and make our means and gather our spoil and increase and prosper, don't we? Don't we? I don't have a bunch of people here that have no vision or goals in life of prosperity, do we? We have plans, don't we? We want to have a fishing ship, don't we? And not so much fishing, it's whatever you're fishing for. Everybody that goes out and works to make an income and tries to put away and tries to be able to raise a family, we want that fishing ship. This is not the kind of ship they got onto. See, the ship that they got onto to follow Jesus was a ship of transport, not a ship for fishing. Remember, Jesus told them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So in essence, it was a different fishing ship. It was a ship of transport. Jesus was taking them on a journey. How many people know that whenever you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you get on His ship that you start, you you begin to take a journey. Now, I want to stop here and be able to sort of decipher between what we're talking about and the picture He's painting. These disciples made an earnest, honest decision to leave what they thought was their profession, their income, their source of stability, their financial means to provide. It's what they knew. It's what they were comfortable with. They were there, and they decided to leave because they hit a a hard time, a bad spot, a drought. They hit everything that, that was starting to go wrong. And so when Jesus came by and promised them this, they followed him. They didn't know him yet. They followed him. And they followed him onto a different kind of ship. This ship was a ship of transport. Understand, when you accept the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart, do you know that not many people will accept the Lord Jesus Christ in their heart when everything is going right? It takes some kind of adversity. Something happens. Something comes along and and changes your mind. And all of a sudden you see, I need something besides what I'm having is not fulfilling me. Listen, I might do all of this and end up not having anything. I might be lost. And then when you realize I might be lost, then you realize, hey, I am lost. I've never accepted Jesus Christ to get to God. So in essence, when you accept Jesus and that he died for you, he shed his blood and you realize I'm a sinner. I can't get to God staying on my ship. I need to step off my ship and get on Jesus' ship. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. So when you get saved, you step off of your ship, you step onto Jesus' ship. But Jesus' ship is a ship of transport. It's a ship that's going on a journey. And that journey is going to take you through the places where you need to be. And undoubtedly, It is not a journey that we would ever say that we would take. How many people have experienced adversities and trials on your journey through life that you definitely say, I would not have signed up for that. But you know, God has a way of taking you through those things. And when you come out, you say, well, look at that. Look at that. Look at that. You see, it's a journey. So they were going on a journey, and in the middle of their journey, they hit the same thing that we hit. They hit a storm. So as we continue to read, we we understand that when we get to verse 23, he entered the ship, they followed in verse 24 and 25. I want you to notice their journey, their journey from one side to the next was interrupted by a terrible storm. The terrible storm caused waves to 
tossed the boat back and forth. It became covered with waves. The disciples were afraid for their lives. And they went to Jesus who was asleep. And they woke him and they said, Save us, we're going to perish. Have you ever been out on a boat that was tossed in the sea? I used to have a hobby of going offshore fishing. And I loved it. We would go offshore and you'd go 50 or 60 miles out and the boat wouldn't really be that big, but you'd go out there and you'd be able to catch big fish. and Everything was great unless the wind and the waves got up. And if the wind and the waves got up, it wasn't a good fishing trip. I've been there when waves were coming over the boat. I've been there when the boat was going like this and I could touch the water and like this and I could touch the water. Have you ever been there? Well, that's a bad, bad time. And that's what happened to them. But understand that there was a lesson in this storm. You see, when it began to storm, Jesus was where? Somebody tell me. He was asleep. For some reason, the storm wasn't bothering Jesus, but the disciples ran to Jesus and they said, save us, save us, we're going to perish. Now, interesting fact here that we don't think about much. Do you know that four of those people in that boat were seasoned sailors? They were always on boats, but yet they were scared. So they ran and said, save us. And I want you to notice how Jesus handles the situation. He told them, first of all, why are you so fearful? Oh, ye of little faith. Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. At this point in time, someone here may think Jesus was a little harsh. Who wouldn't be scared if you were in a storm? Who wouldn't be panicking if you were in a storm? Understand this. Jesus described them as, O oh, ye of little faith. Almost an insult. They were following Jesus. They had left their boat for crying out loud. They'd got on his boat, so he's going to say, Hey, the storm shouldn't have bothered you. Understand the lesson behind this. What we need to realize is that Jesus was telling them, Hey, why are you scared? Basically, you're in the boat with me. You're not in your own boat anymore. You're in the boat with me. Remember, guys, when I called you off of your boat, I said, come and follow me. You're in my boat. What did I tell you before you got on this boat? I said, we're going from point A to point B. And who am I? I'm the Son of God. So if I say we're going from point A to point B, we will get to point B. Your faith should not be wavered by the storm that you think is going to separate you from point B. Your faith should be strong enough, O oh, ye of little faith. The storm is coming. Yes, it is. Let it toss us about. Let us do it. I'm sleeping. Why am I sleeping? Because God told me we were going over here. And if he told me we were going over here, I don't care what, he meet, what we meet in the middle of here and there. That's going to be my testimony. I'm sleeping. Why are you guys all panicked? Glory to God. What a picture, right? You see, I think we forget sometimes whenever we hop off of our boat and accept the Lord Jesus as our Savior and we get on His boat and we're faced with things, we forget to think, hey, I'm on His boat. Not on your boat anymore. You're a passenger on a transport ship. This is not about what you're going to make fishing today. You signed up to be fishers of men. Sounds to me like you're thinking like you're still on the old boat. Now, I don't know if you're guilty of it, but I've been guilty of it so many times. All of a sudden, a storm of life hits you and you begin to be obsessed with it. You're thinking about it day. You're thinking about it night. All of a sudden, you're consumed with it and you're crying out. And you're thinking, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know. This isn't going to work out. That isn't going to work out. And I don't know what's going to happen. And today, Jesus stands up and he says, oh, you have little faith. Didn't you get on my ship? If you got on my ship, I'm going to take you to where I told you I was going to take you. Now, basically what Jesus was saying is God's got us. God's got us. No matter what kind of storm, God's got us. 
But it makes a big difference whether you trust him or not. You know, I, I've used the example before. I think I have. Maybe, it's, maybe it hadn't been on a Sunday morning lesson. But understand, I've used the example before. If my child, if my child sees me on a daily basis, give them a place to sleep, food to eat, shelter over them, a warm house or cold house or whatever it is they desire, protection from the enemy. If I give them that on a daily basis, but that child comes to me and they begin to come to me and they say, Dad, listen, hey, just thinking, but are we going to get to eat today? And I say, yeah, don't worry, we're going to get to eat today just like every day. And they come that night and they say, hey, are we going to, have a, we're going to get to sleep here tonight? Are we going to get to sleep here? And I say, yeah, we're going to get to sleep here. Well, well what about, are we going to have money for the lights to be on? Is it going to be uh, cold tonight in here or we, will we be okay? And I say, yeah, I'm going to take care of it. You just rest easy and I provide for them. I can understand that might be a child who is just insecure, Right? But if that child continues to come to me and come to me in a state of panic every day, and that child says that every single day, at some point I'm going to stop and say, Hey, listen, have I not done this for you every single day? And you come doubting me. Why do you come doubting me? You don't believe in me. You don't believe that I love you enough to make sure you've got these things. After a while... I would be so displeased if my child showed that kind of lack of trust in me. Yet we do that to God on a daily basis, don't we? This storm comes and we, our knees start quivering. And we forget that it's the God that hung the sun in the sky. It's the God that lets you be created. It's the God that's given you breath. It's the God that's going to take you from point A to point B. And that's what God was trying to show them through Jesus. Jesus said, oh, you have little faith. I told you we were going there. Sit down. I was sleeping. You see, this story was there to show them and to show the, us that if we're in the boat with him, if we've left our ship to get on his ship, if we're taking our journey with him, then we don't need to be afraid. If Jesus told them they were going to the other side, then they were going to make it to the other side, storm or no storm. You see, the ship, the ship was a more important ship than the ship that they left. The ship that they left gave them daily provisions. This ship gave them eternal provisions. Understand something. We have to know that in this life, we are going to have trouble. We're going to have storms. How many people in here have led a life so far and never encountered some kind of adversity, some kind of problem, some kind of trouble? Anybody in here need to meet with you? There's a chapter in the book that I want to write, and I want to put you in it, okay? No, we have storms. Understand, we live under a curse, right? The curse of sin. So we know that things are not going to be perfect. And I love the way Job put it. Job was pretty to the point. Job suffered some adversity, right? But in Job chapter 14, verse 1, he says, Man that is born of woman is of a few days and full of trouble. We're going to face some trouble. So here's what I want you to see today. I think, I'm not the smartest man, but I do think this. I would rather know that I know how to make it through trouble and that's where my focus is than to be somebody that says, oh, I want to do everything in life to make sure that I never have a problem. Is that ever going to happen? No. But I think sometimes we focus so much on being able to say, hey, I want to do, do something to make sure that I never have a problem. I never want to have a problem. The key thing that we need to do is know that we're going to have problems. I want to be able to get through it. And have peace about it. The person that says, I'm shooting for a problem-free life is going to lead a life that's disappointing. But a person that says, I want to be able to have peace in the midst of my problems, that person is going to lead a fulfilled life. We face health problems. 
We face financial problems. We face relationship problems. We face child problems. We face all kind of problems. And sometimes this overwhelms us. But we have to remember, if we've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, we've decided to follow Him, we've decided to get on His boat, then we're on a journey with Him, and He can rebuke any storm in our lives. But we need to remember that we're with Him. Whatever happens on the journey is going to change the lives of the people that experience it. We hang on to this verse, Romans 8, 28. Understand how powerful it is and why God put it in there. He says, for we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Understand that so many times something happens in our life and immediately when it happens, it's a health diagnosis. It's a, it's a financial problem. It's something that just floors us. And all of a sudden, as soon as it happens, we open the mail and we see it in there. No matter what it is, we automatically put it in the bad category. Hey, something bad has happened today. We put it in the bad category because it's not according to our plan. It's not what our nets were trying to catch. We forget that we're on the journey with him. We think we're still on our fishing boat. So we put it in the bad category. And then we see through that. That if this problem wouldn't have happened. Then our relationship wouldn't have been restored with the Lord. That the people's lives wouldn't have been changed. That this marriage wouldn't have been saved. That this people wouldn't have come into fellowship with God. And we realize this wasn't bad. It was good. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God. In other words, when you get on Jesus' ship, you're not on the good ship lollipop, you're on Jesus' ship. That's good. It's going to be good. Whatever happens, no matter what category you want to put it in, if you are loving God, serving Him, understand, you don't have to understand it. You don't have to be able to explain it away. Understand that God will make it and orchestrate it out to be good. And in His tapestry of life, when all those pieces come back together and we stand at a more uh, a more intellectual viewpoint, having spiritual intelligence to look and see, and we stand back and look from heaven's viewpoint, we'll be able to say, thank you, God, for that thing that I thought was a dilemma. Because when I thought it was a dilemma, I got ready to jump the ship. And it was actually something that you were doing to be able to help me and the others around me. I would have never seen it. It was a storm. We really think, though, that we're smart enough to tell the difference. I know as I was studying for this sermon and God had laid it on my heart, showing me the differences in the ship. I looked at my own life and I was doing just a, actually a, a repentant sermon, realizing that, hey, I need to preach this to me and I hope it hits somebody else. Because I realized that I guess I've had so many storms because I keep failing the test. So you don't pass a test till you take a test, but then when you take it, you need to pass it or you're going to keep taking it. It's no different than school, Right? You don't take the test, you don't pass the test. You don't pass the test, you don't advance. You're going to keep taking the same test over and over again. And the way I see it, speaking to Christians, once you do get on his boat, you need to remember that there's going to be a variety of storms that come. And if I were to put those in different categories, I would say a Christian faces storms because God knows that we need to. I think Christians have three different types of storms that they face. The first kind of storm would be a storm of perfection. The second time type of storm would be a storm of correction. The third type of storm would be a storm of direction. Storms of perfection, storms of correction, storms of direction. You say explain. Okay, since you ask, right? I think God has reasons for letting these storms come the same way that he let these disciples come. And I want to be able to show you what he's trying to do through these storms. Now, understand, Christian, you are where? You're on whose boat? You're on Jesus' boat. You stepped off of whose boat? And that, what kind of boat was that? That was a fishing boat. Now you're on a transport boat, right? You've got a mission. You're going where Jesus wants you to go. So bear that in mind. Understand, the first kind of storm that he'll let come is a storm of perfection. This storm of perfection happens in our life so that we can see things in a different way. So that our faith becomes stronger. Our relationship with God grows closer. Those storms of perfection, they fine-tune us. Doesn't make you perfect. What it does is it purifies you. We lose perspective, don't we? In Christian life, we lose perspective. 
We get focused on something. We're back on our boat. We're casting nets. We want this for us. And then somewhere or another, we get to the, to the, the, the thinking of, we want this for our family. And, and if you look at the things we want for our family, you can list them on a sheet. You need to do that sometimes. Moms and dads, the things that you're spending the most time, the things you want for your family, and then go by and see, do these things have anything to do with their relationship with God? If not, you're probably fishing off your old boat. Understand this. We're on a journey. You're giving children so you can carry them along on that journey. We're giving things that come in our life, storms, to redefine us, to perfect us, so that we can be better children of God. I love what Paul says to the church at Rome in Romans 5, verse 3 and 4. You can put that on your notes sometimes, but he says, we glory in tribulations. How many people can say, we glory in tribulations? Praise God, another problem. We don't say that, do we? But listen to what Paul's saying. We glory in tribulations. Why? Knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience worketh experience, and experience worketh hope. In other words, what Paul is trying to say is, We learn to trust God more and more in the midst of trouble, in the midst of a storm, in the midst of tribulation. That's when our patience grows. And when our patience grows, then our experience or our character grows. And when our character grows, our hope grows. What do you mean your hope? Your hope. My hope is built in nothing less, right? You see, once you go through something and it's trouble, And it's a storm. And you see that God got you through it. Then the next time you have it, well, that's experience. It builds your character. So the next time you go through it, you're saying, hey, I've been through this before. And then the next time you go through it, I've been by this through this before. And then he lets you tell it somebody else. So your character builds hope. So when you get in that next storm, in that next storm, you're being able to say, I've been in a storm before. God is faithful. He will not suffer me to be tempted above that which which I'm able to bear but with that, also make a way for me to escape, right? 1 Corinthians 10, 13. He tells me that. He's faithful. But I don't learn that with one storm, do I? I don't learn it with two storms. I don't learn it with three storms. What is he saying? Listen, your faith comes with your storms. We choose to have a lot of storms. That's scary, isn't it? Let's see, the last storm didn't do anything. Let's bring another one on him. I feel like that's where I've been before, right? All he's wanting you to do is believe. All he's wanting you to do is is be that disciple that's on the boat that says, hey, Jesus, storm's out here, but hey, I'm on your boat. I'm on your boat. Look at me. What I should be doing is help calm some of the other disciples down. Why? Well, because I've been through it before and it built experience and the experience built hope. You see, these storms of perfection, when we learn to trust God more and more in the midst of troubles and tribulation, that's when our patience grows. When our patience grows, this experience grows. All of that builds to hope. Do you know the reason that a person panics? You know, the reason that a person sits awake and and does not uh, get the sleep they need, and they think and they dwell on this and dwell on this, you say, oh, because they're a worrier. No, you know what's really behind it? They don't have the hope that they need to have. They're wishing, but they're not living with the hope that God promises. It says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. That I'll supply all of your needs according to my riches and glory. That if you seek me first in my kingdom, that I'll give you all these things that you desire. That I'll never leave you in a place to where you're wanting, that I'll use you. All these promises that he gives us, when we stress and worry, we are basically those people in that boat saying, save us, we perish. And I'm no different than that son when I'm sitting there and God sees me every day. At some point, God's got to reach and grab me up and say, listen, you're my child. You're supposed to have a testimony of trusting me. Have I ever failed you? So that's why we have storms of perfection. It's to take Christians and make them better Christians. It's to take servants and make them better servants. It's to increase our faith. And then we have storms of correction. 
This is the next kind of storm. What is a storm of correction? A storm of correction is when God allows things to happen to us so that we'll come out of sin and come into fellowship with Him. You say, Pastor Mike, are you saying that sometimes bad things happen because we've got sin in our life? Yes, I am. Is that why bad things happen? No, that's just one of the storms. Don't leave here saying, Pastor Mike, you said I was in sin. That's why I've got this and I've got that going on. I don't know. You can judge for that. You'll know immediately if the Holy Spirit convicts you. And right now that big sin in your life is blinking like a neon sign. Then, yeah, that's you, right? But, you know, this is what God uses to call sinners from off the ship. It's storms of correction. Where you have to correct what you're doing. You know, if you're a Christian and you're living with some unconfessed sin and you know it and God says you're not supposed to be doing it and you're convicting of it, then understand, He can't let everything go right for you. It's a storm of correction. In other words, it's a blessed, righteous storm that says, I'm going to shake your boat a little bit until you're scared and you have to come down and wake Jesus and admit to Him you don't have faith, you've been doing the wrong thing, and you need to repent, confess, step off of that boat, come onto my boat. I've seen both of these storms, have you? The Bible actually tells us Hebrews 12, 6, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and he scourges every son whom he receiveth. God disciplines us. He punishes us when we do wrong like any good parent should do. You want to have a house that's under control, that's not dysfunctional, where the children are obedient to the parents? You want to have a house where the children respect the parents? Put discipline in that household. Let them understand there's an authority higher than them. And then when they do something wrong, don't talk about it, punish them. Guess what? God's the best parent. He loves you. That's why He punishes you. That's why He disciplines you. Because if He doesn't, you'll keep going down the wrong path. You'll keep casting that net the other way. What He wants you to do is to realize you can't make it work. So I'm going to show you. I'm going to break you down. And if you don't get broke down at this level, guess what? You'll move to this level. And if you don't get broke down at this level, you'll move to this level. Why? Why? Because he loves us and he doesn't give up on us. And when you get low enough to where you're able to say, God, my ship is not working. My nets are full of holes. I've been casting and casting and catching nothing. And the time that I'm not casting, I'm trying to fix and I'm running in circles, and I don't have any peace, and I'm worried about this, and I'm worried about this. And listen, this storm is here, and this might be a physical storm, and this might be a financial storm, and this might be a relationship storm. God, listen, I'm worried. I'm stressed. I want to correct my ways. And guess what he'll do? He'll stand up, and he'll speak to your storm. Be still. Amen. Glory to God. Is that not cool? You see that picture? And it says the wind and sea calmed. He has that ability. You say, why have I kept having this storm so long? I can tell you it's either a storm of perfection or a storm of correction. Well, then it may be our third kind of storm, a storm of direction. But understand, this storm of perfection, the disciples were going through that. He needed them to increase their faith. But a storm of correction, that's something that like David went through. You remember David, he decided that his sin... He was bigger than what God said, so he saw Bathsheba, he took Bathsheba, he laid with her, he committed adultery, and then he tried to kill her husband, he had a plan of extortion, then he did have her husband killed, so then he was a murderer, and then he tried to hide that sin, and that sin ate him up because he was lying, he was not truthful, and God sent a storm of correction and took his child, and David crawled back to God. Jonah had a storm of correction. God said, go do this. Jonah said, I don't like the way that sounds. I'm going to go do this. And he ran. Jonah ended up in the belly of a whale, right? He faced a storm of correction. But I want you to notice something. Between storms of perfections and storms of correction, there's another kind of storm. Do you know that sometimes God puts us in a 
position to be with others while they're going through storms so that we can be that voice in the storm that they need to hear? Hey, this is a storm of direction. And you're the one that's called to be that voice in somebody else's storm. Do you know you never have a more attentive ear than when somebody doesn't have the answer themselves? When everything is going right, you won't get many people to listen to you, will you? But when they can't find an answer, that's when people are searching. Searching for what? Searching for an answer. Understand, this storm of direction is where you're put in somebody else's storm so that you can give direction. You're that voice that says, trust God. In that, you're giving direction. You're that voice that says, cry out to Him. You're giving direction. You're that voice that says, don't panic, don't fear, don't be afraid. You're giving direction. You're that voice that says, God will get you to the other side. You're giving direction. There was nobody in that ship with those disciples that were giving any direction. But once they faced that storm of perfection, I'll guarantee you the rest of the time they could give advice, they could give direction. You see, we need to be that voice that says, stay in Jesus' ship and you'll get to the destination that's best for you. Or either that person that witnessed to a lost, uh, somebody that's lost that says, get in Jesus' ship. So, you might walk up on a lot of storms in people's lives. You might have things happen and say, oh no, this is terrible news. Understand, it's a storm. There's something for us to learn in every single storm. Either it's a storm for our own perfection, a storm for our own correction, or a storm that we're supposed to give direction. How about that? I hear about new storms every day of my life, and I don't know that I would have realized this years and years ago. But I have to grade each storm based on those three things because first I need to look at myself and say, God, is this something that you're doing because you need to bring me closer to you? And then, God, is this something that you're doing or you're allowing to happen because there's something that I need to get out of my life? Something I need to correct? Or, God, is this an opportunity for me to be that voice of direction to somebody else? How neat is that? I think the best example that we have in the Bible of someone who was that voice in the midst of the storm was literally a man who was the voice in the midst of the storm. And that's the Apostle Paul. Do you know that the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 27, I ask you to turn there, but Acts chapter 27, the Apostle Paul was that voice in the midst of the storm. He was that person that cried out and said, God said this is going to be this way. Trust in Him. Believe in Him. But don't jump off the ship. You know, even Christians, so many times, something doesn't go our way or we can't figure it out. And the first thing we want to do, we realize, hey, we've said so many times, well, I know the Lord's will is perfect and I know the Lord's doing this and the Lord's blessed me in this way and blessed me in this way. But when something goes wrong, we're ready to jump ship. God needs some people to stay on the ship. He needs some people to be that voice that's crying out to all the others that are facing a storm of correction or a storm of perfection. What's it going to be like if you don't have anybody to serve in a storm of direction? God's got a purpose for every single storm that comes. Time will allow us to be able to go over Paul's great influence in this storm that he was in, but we'll get to it. What I think we ought to consider right now is just what we've learned today. I think we need to consider, first of all, and the most important thing is, whose boat am I on? Whose ship am I on? So it's about ships first. Have you stepped off of your own ship this ship that has all the things that you want to do, it's got your vision, your destination. I mean, you've been trained to, to have vision, to be able to, to have a, a plan or whatever. So this is your ship. Your ship is a ship that you sail. You run it. It goes by what you say, what you think is right, what you think is wrong. And your ship, your ship is something that meets immediate needs. Have you stepped off of that ship or are you still on it? 
You step off of it by accepting that you're a sinner. I'm a sinner, you're a sinner. You accept it by realizing that you can't get to God by staying on that ship and that you have to make an effort to get off of that ship. That means you have to repent. You have to ask God to forgive you. You're saying basically, God, I realize I'm a sinner. I'm sorry for being a sinner. I was born a sinner. I know I sinned. I need to get to you. But you do it by believing that Jesus Christ is the only way you can get to God. And the same way that Jesus walked up to Simon, Andrew, James and John is the same way that he walks up to you today if you're not saved. You know what he says in simple words? Follow me. Or stay on your ship. It's your choice. And the next thing we need to look at is our, our nets. You know, the thing that kept me on my ship so long was I was so caught up in my nets. Throwing one here, throwing one there, fixing this, fixing that. You'll forget that you really just need to change ships if all you're focusing on is what net you're throwing out there, right? Everything I was fishing for was temporary. And then storms. Once you get on his boat, realize that you are going to have storms, but you'd have them anywhere. But God puts these storms in your life because he loves you. He puts these storms in your life because he wants you to grow closer to him. He puts these storms in your life because you're away from him. He wants you to get back to him. And he puts these storms in your life so that you can help somebody else come to him or get back to him. But every storm has a reason. How many of you are facing storms right now? How many of you have been in storms? Don't you know God speaks to us through those storms? Don't you know Jesus is is out to be able to help you? He's just trying to tell you, hey, change ships, or if you're on my ship, stop worrying. Stop panicking. That David that I told you about, David that had that storm of correction, he gave one of the greatest things that I think the Bible, one of the greatest statements I think the Bible ever had in it that gives me such assurance. It says an old David, an old wise David before he died, he said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. Don't you know we spend all of our life fishing, throwing nets because we don't want to beg bread. We don't want to go without. We don't want to be unprotected. We don't want to be not provided for. And the key is getting on the right boat and having faith while you're on that boat that no matter what, Jesus is taking you from point A to point B. Whatever's in between is called the journey. The journey is going to change you and it's going to change the people around you. So get on with your journey. Stop stressing. Stop worrying. Stop dwelling on the storm. Jesus can speak to that storm if he wants to. If not, then it's a storm of direction. That storm doesn't go away and you've covered the storm of perfection and the storm of correction, then realize, praise God, you're going to use me in a storm of direction no matter if it's happening to me. You say, well, that's really just a good little Johnny Sunshine way of looking at it. That's the way God wants us to look at it. Or else you can be that child that runs around crying all the time wondering if your daily needs are going to be met. There's a lot in storms, isn't there? Where are you at today? If you're in this congregation, if you're listening to this by way of radio or CD, wherever it finds you at, if you've truly never left your ship, you need to do it today. He has one call to you. It's follow me. But to follow him, you have to leave your ship. Confess that you're a sinner. Ask Jesus to come into your heart. He will save you. And if you've done that today, he's looking for you to be somebody on his boat. And you might see yourself today and say, I'm lacking in that area. Guess what? He will increase your faith if you ask him to increase your faith. He will increase your strength if you ask him to increase your strength. He will give you an opportunity to give direction. Your purpose in life is not to be on a fishing boat 
trying to get immediate needs. Your purpose in life is to change this world. Everybody that's created, you change this world by being on Jesus' boat from point A to point B. How are you doing on your journey? Are you one of the ones that are quivering in the storms? Are you one of the ones that are standing up saying, hey, Jesus is with me. Pray with me. Father God, I love you and I praise you and I thank you for this day. I thank you, God, for loving us the way you do. I thank you, God, for ministering to us the way you do. I pray that you take your word today. You find us where we're at. I pray that you hold us to the accountability, Lord, that we need to be held to. I pray, God, that each person looks at themselves to be able to see, Lord, where we're at with you. If there's anyone here that's lost, they've never really left their ship. I pray today, Lord, that they see their need, Father, to come to you by accepting and believing what Jesus did for them. And I pray, God, for every Christian in this room, Lord, as they pray for strength today, as they lift up their voices, they pray, God, that you would take away all worry, all fear, and they stand confident, Lord, knowing that they're in your ship. I pray that you come upon them with a blanket of peace, a blanket, Lord, of boldness to be able to go out and bear witness and give direction as others see their storm. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? Page 303. I praise God that he finds us and he speaks to us and what a freedom and a peace it was to be able to speak his word today. I appreciate the spirit that you brought into this room. I appreciate you being so attentive to God's word today. I never have any idea 
why, for what reason that he ever leads me in any direction to preach one topic, one sermon, in any time frame. I never have any idea. It's the most random thing I have ever seen in my life, but I realize that there is no way that he would have led me this clearly to this spot if there were not those in here that needed to hear it. Not of my own benefit, because I need to hear it, but God loves you, so he needed you to hear whatever it was he had to say. Not, not that I'm doing something, that he's doing something. So I praise him for that. And I thank you for being here today. I look forward to being able to worship with you tonight. So come back tonight. Um, we're going to have another message. I'm excited about it. But, uh, uh, we don't really have anything tonight. We've had a lot of things going on on Sunday nights. But tonight, just get to come in here and preach. And so I'm excited about it. So come tonight. Uh, looking forward to being able to worship with you. So uh, any announcements before we leave? Anybody? No?